Hi everyone, this is uh, Stephen Freitas. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's OAAA lunch break. Uh, today's webinar is the first in a two-part series. Uh, today we're going to answer the questions, why is programmatic important to out of home? And joining us today are three experts uh, on this topic. We have Leslie Lee, the VP of Marketing from Vistar Media. We have Mark Bartholomew, who is the VP Group Director at PosterScope. And Ian Dallimore, the VP Digital Growth at Lamar Advertising. And before we start, uh, we do want to cover a few housekeeping topics. Uh, we, were, uh, we will welcome your questions throughout the webinar, so please feel free to submit them using the Zoom chat function or question function. And if we aren't able to get to your questions today, we will follow up with you individually later. And all of our webinars are featured on our website under the webinar library link. And the recording today will be available later today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the group. Enjoy the panel. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Mark. I'm actually the first time presenting for the OAAA, so um, hoping to share some of my knowledge with you alongside Ian and, and Leslie, who we've worked together to pull this, this presentation for you. Um, if we could skip on to the next slide, please. Um, before we go into what is programmatic, I just wanted to give you a little bit about my experience, because probably like a lot of you, 12 to 18 months ago, I didn't really know too much about programmatic itself. I knew of the concept, the top line concept. I knew that it existed in the online world, but I didn't really know too much about how it was transferable to the out of home space in the physical world um, and really what the benefits were to our clients. So my, my kind of message to set up the session is don't worry too much about that. I think if I could do it in 12 to 18 months, you guys can probably get up to speed a lot quicker than that. Um, there's a lot to get your head around, but today's session and Thursday's session will certainly give a lot of you the foundations to, to really start that journey. So with that, I wanted to just talk about programmatic as a word. It's, it's become quite um, a dirty word in some senses in that people are either struck with fear or confusion when they hear it. And I think it's been over-engineered over from my point of view quite a lot where it doesn't really need to be. So if we can just chuck, uh, go to the next slide. Um, great place to start is talking about the definition. So what is programmatic? Programmatic, simply put, refers to the automation of the buying and selling of advertising through software. It really does not need to be any more complicated than that. We know that programmatic was built for the online space and typically actually that was for online browser ads. So if you think banner ads when you were on a desktop or laptop, it was created um, really for that market where users were targeted based on their online behavior. So using cookies, we were able to target in the online world one-to-one -one users based on the websites that they visited. Bids were then placed on the impressions where the audience that you were targeting and the targeting parameters you set up front were met. Um, I'd use this example on the right here with the image, um, let's, let's call her Cindy for, for the sake of this example. Cindy has a personal laptop, a work laptop. She has a cell phone and a tablet. She goes between all of these different devices every day, visits websites, opens applications, Programmatic really allows us to understand the consumer journey in the online world and understand what Cindy is doing and how best to target her. So just thinking about this from a car buyer's perspective, and this is an example I always like to use, you know, prior to programmatic technology, if you were looking for someone who could potentially be in the market to buy a car, you might advertise on Motor Trend website, for example. Programmatic actually allowed us to look at the consumer journey so that you know if someone is, is accessing multiple websites related to cars, whether that's reviews or actually car websites themselves, you can understand more about where they're going and then target them on different areas of, of, of the system. So if we can skip to the next slide. This has really uh, developed you know, exponentially over the last few years. It started with desktop display. It's now moved into mobile and video advertising. Um, 
and different ways of transacting programmatically have, have come to the fore as well. If you look at the chart to the right, even in the last four to five years, the shift to mobile is absolutely huge. And it's unsurprising when you think that the grip that mobile devices have on our lives now and, and how big a role they play, it's unsurprising that, that in five years, mobile spend in the programmatic space has gone from less than 30% to about 50% of the spend. And then the latest iteration of programmatic has, has seen us move into the more traditional channels. So a lot of you would be aware or, or have heard of addressable TV. Radio is now part of that as well. And of course, digital out of home. And digital out of home really, really has seen a lot of growth, which we'll come on to in the next few slides. And it's set to continue to grow. And the reason for that is that devices and certainly mobile location data that we can derive from, from mobile devices has really allowed us to, to create deeper engagement and, and deeper audiences to target in the physical world. If we can move on to the next slide. So I thought it'd be worth talking about the evolution of, evolution of buying in the out of home space actually, because we're, we're quite often jumping straight into this conversation and, and talking about various platforms um, and what that means for out of home. But let's, let's go back a little bit and talk about the history of, of out of home. You guys are all aware um, of the historical way and the legacy way of trading out of home, buying out of home, and it was really based on a panel or a screen cost. Largely, the price you pay for that panel or that screen is based on real estate. It's based on the location and to an extent, the audience, but really it's based on the size of the screen or, or the unit and its location in relation to, to the physical world. We then saw what I think was the, the first step in the programmatic journey, which was where digital out of home vendors moved to a share of voice or share of time approach. So instead of paying for a panel or screen, you're actually buying a specific percentage of time or a number of minutes in the hour. The great thing about this is it allowed vendors the flexibility to accommodate more advertisers but it also allowed advertisers or buyers like myself to, to really hone in on the key moments and the key hours that were relevant to my target audience. So then enter the, the CPM model, which of course was born in, in the online world. Um, and now we're moving to that, certainly in part within the out of home space, but this is all about the audience. This is the price you pay per 1000 impressions delivered against the specific audience that you wish to target. The one thing I would say about all, all three of these approaches is that there's not a one size fits all. We're not coming to you today and saying that programmatic is going to replace everything we've done previously. It's just another way to buy out of home. So the panel cost for premium inventory may be the way to go still. You may want to pay, buy or sell screens based on the real estate and that's okay. You may still want to buy a share of time. However, what programmatic and what the CPM model does is really, really allow us to fix on the audience that we wish to target and make sure we're only paying for that audience. So if we can skip onto the next slide. So just to summarize what programmatic is, programmatic refers to the automation of, of buying and selling advertising through software, simple as that. This is often executed via an auction um, through a marketplace or an exchange as they're known. And then publishers, in this case, the media vendors, provide the inventory that they wish to be made available, which is then discoverable by the buyer at either the individual impression or the spot level. The buyers then evaluate what they wish to buy or bid on in real time using a real time bidding process. And this is normally based on pre-agreed business rules. So as a buyer, I would go into my platform, I would create my audience and I would set up the targeting criteria that I wish to use. And then I only bid on the inventory that becomes available if that meets the criteria that I've set up front. We could skip on to the next. So what is the state of the programmatic, um, of programmatic today in the out of home industry? I mentioned this before, it's, it's growing a lot. And if we could just skip on to the next slide, we've got a couple of charts showing this. Right now, the out of home industry is sitting roughly at about $8.6 billion. You know, we all know that before COVID, we were, you know, riding the wave, if you like. We'd seen um, almost 40, I think, consecutive months of growth, 7% growth year on year. And we can really see that growth coming from digital out of home specifically. So digital out of home was estimated to be at about 2.7 billion of that 8.6, roughly a 31% share. 
And then in terms of programmatic, our best estimates are that that was at about 180 million, um, which sits at around 7% of digital out of home growth. Though Ian, certainly when you and I were discussing this prior to uh, today's call, I know that you'd, the growth that you'd seen certainly at Lamar seems to indicate that the, uh, the interest is, is much higher. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, it's, and that number, you know, we all, I know as we prepared for this call in, in our, our larger programmatic uh, OAAA committee that we all sit on, we were, we were riding that wave February, March, just prior to this. So uh, the interest is there. So I'm excited about this. And that, that number is, seems small in the overall grand scheme of things as we discussed, but that number is gonna grow significantly next year for sure. Great, so if we could skip on to the next slide. Um, it's worth noting, and I wanted to call this out, that actually representation um, across the out-of-home landscape has, has come from in, in many shapes and sizes. You know, certainly us at PostScope, we've adopted our own workflows. I know Ian, you guys at, at your end would be adopting your new workflows as well. But it's really an opportunity for us to add another feather to the out-of-home cap and really upskill our people so that we're not just out of home experts, but we're programmatic experts as well. And there's definitely a fusion to take place there. And I think you're seeing that a lot more now where programmatic experts and out of home experts are coming together and really, really getting the best out of this relatively new opportunity. Um, a lot of people ask me, uh, and I'm sure this will come up in the questions, you know, when will my job be replaced by a machine? I really don't see it like that at all. Actually, I, I see this um, as a way to create efficiencies across our workflows and our processes that will actually enable us to do our jobs as we're supposed to, which is sell out of home as a medium, as a channel, to those who either um, underinvest or don't invest at all. Um, so certainly I think, you know, seeing new ad ops teams, product teams, tech teams come up, you know, I don't see that replacing human interaction. As an agency, our, our best asset is our people, and that will be continued um, throughout this journey, I would say. Great, so if we could skip on to the next slide. So I wanted to talk to you about the benefits of programmatic, and I'll, I'll take you through this from a buyer's perspective, of obviously sitting within PostScope and, and working with various client teams. You know, I certainly have my thoughts around this, Ian, I know you're going to jump in with your, um, with, with the benefits for, from a vendor point of view as well. So if we could just skip onto the next slide, I'll, I'll run you through those. The first one for me is, is the aggregation of supply, right? So right now, if I want to access multiple different pieces of supply through various vendors and, and thousands of different um, formats, I need to have individual conversations with every single one of those vendors. The process is quite manual um, and, and quite honestly, the responses we get back are quite inconsistent because there's no uh, formulaic approach or consistent approach to responses. So programmatic really allows me as a buyer to access a full ecosystem of inventory. So no matter which vendor it is across multiple environments, hundreds of thousands of screens, I can access all of that inventory, digital out of home inventory from one access point. So that, in, in a large way, removes the need for the manual RFP process that, that many of us get bogged down with on the day-to-day -day, um, when, when we're working on, on specific plans and briefs. Um, and we can centralize that, that buying platform as well. So not only can we access that inventory, we can trade on that inventory and buy that inventory very, very quickly at scale, and we can tweak it in real time as well. So really aggregating supply is, is one of the main benefits to, to the efficiencies of, of the workflow. And if we skip onto the next side as well, we can talk about the actual workflow itself. So again, the RFP that I send out to maybe 40 or 50 vendors for a national plan, I get 40 or 50 responses back. I then need to spend time collating those responses and ensuring that they are in the same format. Um, it's time consuming. This way, I send out one RFP through one platform I get a consistent response back across all vendors, all um, inventory types. I can scale it up so I can go into the platform and either increase my plan or decrease the size of my plan. And then obviously there's only one contract as well. So that just creates a really, really efficient 
workflow for us internally as buyers. Now, if we can skip onto the next slide, I'll talk more about the client benefits from, from a buyer's point of view as well, because we love our clients and, and you know, we want them to challenge us. But really, if we go to them and say that programmatic is a way to improve our, our workflow, it's not really gonna sell it in as, as well as we like. So we need to think about what benefits we can give back to them as well. So data informed purchasing, really, really big part of that. You know, using data and, and specifically audience data to target the best audience for our particular campaign in the right place at the right time, just adds another element to what we can do in the out of home space. And for me, this does, this it starts with a meaningful audience. I think, you know, gone are the days where we talk about demographics as, as targeting criteria. We're now starting to look at data uh, and certainly mobile location data to understand more about our audiences. So for example, I use this all the time, but someone traveling from Brooklyn into Manhattan who stops by a coffee shop in the morning and, and also goes to a gym could be you know, a fitness enthusiast who loves coffee. So we're starting to build a profile based on their real world behavior uh, and their meaningful actions as well. And then obviously what we can do is, is apply additional targeting criteria as well. So key locations, do we wanna target you know, certain points of interest within a radius? Do we wanna focus on key formats because we know they're more pedestrian facing versus you know, bill, billboard or roadside facing? Are there specific day parts for that audience that we wanna target? You know, worked on, on multiple brands in the past, you know, alcohol brands advertising at nine o'clock on a Monday morning probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But targeting happy hour on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night does make a lot of sense. So again, just selecting the criteria, criteria that's right for that particular audience as well. And then you only place bids on the impressions when that criteria is met. So it's really enabling us to be more efficient with client dollars. Um, and only pay for the audiences that are really worthwhile for that particular brand or product. So if we could skip onto the next slide. Something that's come up re recently, and, and I think COVID has only really accelerated this to be perfectly honest, that the situation we are in is, is security and flexibility around client dollars as well. So buying programmatically really offers an increased layer of, of flexibility. What it enables us to do is optimize our impressions delivery in real time so that we know if a particular market or if a particular format needs more impressions or is delivering better than others, we can actually dial that up and likewise dial down those that aren't delivering well. We can pause our cancel, cancel campaigns mid-flight and you only pay for the impressions that are delivered so that I know if I'm running a particular market and suddenly a lockdown happens again, we can switch that campaign off or pause that campaign and we only pay for what has been delivered up until that point. I think we, we probably underestimated how important and how um, beneficial this is to clients prior to COVID and, and, and COVID has only highlighted that, but really, really important for us to try and bring clients back to the out of home space in, in this current climate. And there are no distant cancellation deadlines as well. As I say, you know, we're, we're not working to 60, 90 day cancellation terms. You only pay for what's being delivered. Um, so really it's just making every dollar that's being spent more effective and more efficient for our clients. And then finally, something that I'm really, really excited about and, and potentially other than the data led targeting piece is, is the measurement piece as well. Out of Home has historically been this kind of offline channel that is very, very good at driving uh, brand awareness and, and increasing brand perceptions. But rarely have we been in a position like we are now where we can really create meaningful metrics that we can measure for the out of home space. So centralizing this buying allows us to do so at scale across all of the vendors and formats we buy. Uh, and there are multiple things we can now measure. So awareness and perception, as I mentioned before, store foot traffic, in the physical world is becoming more and more important as well. You know, identifying which exposed um, consumers are, are then entering a physical bricks and mortar store afterwards. We can now do web and app visits as well. So through device ID data that's passed back um, on those exposed users, we can identify who has then visited the website or the app. And then from there actually ordered. So we can look at sales uplift as well. So all of these really exciting metrics that have rarely been associated with out of home, programmatic suddenly raises these 
and, and puts them front and center, which again, if, if we can prove that the dollars are working in out of home, then it's going to drive more and more money into the channel and bring new advertisers um, to spend with, with us and, and our vendor partners as well. Cool. So that perfectly laid out and honestly, that is why vendors begin to get into this space and why it's important that vendors become a part of um, this new channel. Um, I, I do want to be very clear as we go through this, there is a massive difference between what programmatic is and what automation is. And what we're focused on today is the importance and what programmatic is. Um, I see a lot of questions kind of popping up in the, in the chat box here about which is which, which is better. Um, they're two separate channels. So let's make sure we're focused today on purely programmatic and what we're talking about. Um, Lamar entered the programmatic space about seven years ago, um, actually with our, our friends at Vistar and, and Leslie on the call. And we've begun to kind of understand and learn that space. Um, one of the most important reasons and rationales on why media owners should is because it allows you to make your inventory discoverable to a large set of buyer, buyers literally instantly. And you know we've been partners with the folks at PosterScope and Mark personally and, and our friends at Omnicom and Kinetic. And, and even, the, even the relationships with our out-of-home specialist friends, they're extremely important. But over time, you're still constantly educating those buyers on, hey, we actually have inventory in Paducah, Kentucky. We have inventory in transit in Louisville. So making your inventory become more discoverable is imperative for buyers, both on the out-of-home specialist side and also on the digital uh, agency and the DSP side. And what I mean by that is just the simple ability not to have to cast a net like Mark said and ask for, hey, do you have inventory in this market? All of a sudden, inventory is at the fingertips of any and everyone that's connected in this space. And that's important. Um, it's important for mostly the newer buyers that are coming into the space. And as Mark had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of interest that exists. And the other important side of things, you know, you look at a Lamar, a clear channel and out front, we have massive sales forces. If you're on the call and you're a small independent or you're a place-based network, the ability to go programmatic allows you also not to have to build out a significant sales force. And even as we look at our sales force internally at Lamar, it allows our buyers to be more strategic on how they're pitching inventory, how they're packaging it, and not spending massive amount of hours on filling out spreadsheets that both vendor and agency side despise. And if that's your, why should we do this question to myself, that is my first and immediate response, is allowing that inventory to be aggregated and to be at the fingertips of buyers that you may not even have heard of or had relationships with. That's what programmatic allows in this space. Um, if we could jump to the next slide. Another important aspect of, of programmatic is it really allows you to fully monetize your inventory. And, from a media owner's perspective, specifically as we look at digital, is we live in a world where we have multiple slots. And unless you have the best sales force and the best economy and the best brands, there is no one that is on this call or off this call that has 100% sold out inventory. So what this allows us to do, and, and the chart at the bottom is, is something that we often show internally when we were selling through the idea of programmatic years ago, was as we look at our slot model, and whether you have a slot model or it's just loose time of day, you still have some sort of unsold segmentations that exist in your inventory. Now, what programmatic allows you to do is really maximize and monetize that available inventory via new sales channels with little direct effort. And what I mean by that is, is often we talk about it on the vendor side is there's gapping, right? You have a campaign that ends on a Monday and there's extra slots that are available that aren't flighted to start on a direct deal until next Friday. It's difficult even at the local, regional and national level to have your sales reps go out and it really doesn't make sense for them to go push and say, 
hey, I have a four day buy that's, that's available that I could sell you. Well, if the stars aren't aligned and the brands don't have anything that makes sense for that time, likely what you're gonna do is be offering some sort of PSA or bonus filler um, during that time. The other aspect of this, as we, Lamar specifically, and I know some of our friends, other vendors friends in this space, now that we've monetized a available unsold inventory, we're now looking at how do we maximize that demand? And what I mean by that is kind of price optimization. And price optimization in the programmatic space, specifically for out of home, is very important. You know, we look in the online world and there's some insane number like three to four billion websites that exist. There's a lot of walled gardens exist like a Facebook and Google um, and an Instagram and YouTube. But in the out of home space, there's limited and finite amount of inventory and the ability for us to use programmatic channels to maximize CPMs. And what I mean is as real time bidding is coming in and we wanna maximize and make sure we're getting the highest dollar amount for that impression on slot E for example, or slot D. And as we continue to, to grow in this space month over month, day over day, that inventory and that demand will not only help rise the programmatic CPMs, but as a local GM, you start to look at your inventory and say, wow, I'm selling my CPMs at a much higher level via programmatic. And you begin to make the decision, do I wanna open more slots available for programmatic or as Lamar does, open up all inventory via programmatic? But more importantly, it starts to drive up your rate and that's massive on the vendor side it starts to drive up rate on your direct deals as well, creating that demand. Because again, there's scarcity that exists in the digital out of home space. I believe the number's 10,000 total digital screens today. And that's not a lot of inventory. So again, speaking to my vendor friends on the call, maximizing revenue is one of the other rationales and benefits to the seller side. If we could jump to the next slide. And this is my favorite part, and Mark alluded to this, is the ability to utilize data to be deterministic on when and where to play. So it's, it's gone much further and beyond just the ability to say, hey, I want panel one, seven, and nine on your map. It's trusting the audience, trusting the data that's overlaid, and allowing that brand to come to you and say, here's our KPIs, here's our target audience. We want to target, we were jokingly saying before the call, uh, pumpkin spice latte goers. And that may be someone that shops at Lululemon that also gets coffees during the fall time with um, at Starbucks and has an affinity towards um, Instagram shopping and blog posts. We now have that ability, now that we're aggregated in with programmatic, to overlay that data and to see where does that consumer journey go throughout the day and how do I hit that pumpkin spice latte uh, consumer. We had another word for it, but we'll, we'll spare you the, the pun on that. But again, now when, when I hear sales folks, even internally say, well, programmatic and a machine and a robot's gonna take my job. I would argue that's the furthest from the truth. What we've allowed you to do is we've allowed now the sellers to be very more strategic in working with their agency partners like Marks of the World and say, hey, I noticed that you're, you represent Delta Airlines. I have the ability to build out a business traveler's network and I can target specific audiences. And now they've become a consultative seller and they're selling alongside and they're giving folks like at Mark's team more confidence on why you should buy out of home. So what we're seeing is our sellers are now building out these curated pr premium inventory packages by simply building out deals into the network and into our supply side partners and dropping them in and pushing them out. And that, that's really where we're at as an industry in this space via programmatic. It's not just automating how to buy, it's being much more strategic and targeted on how we sell inventory. If we could jump to the next slide. And just to kind of wrap up here on the benefits of the seller side, it, it's, you know, we, we love the fact that the poster scopes and kinetics and the OMGs and the billups of the world have access to buy programmatic and they've done a great job of not cannibalizing and just shifting funds over. They're truly going about it the right way. 
but more importantly, that number on the right. And that's what keeps me up and keeps a lot of vendors up at night is the online spend is roughly $135 billion that exists. And that is mobile, social, uh, YouTube TV, et cetera. And our industry sits at $9 billion. I would argue the larger reason why we haven't tapped into that $135 billion is we just haven't had our in inventory accessible to those demand side platforms that Leslie is gonna talk about, to those digital agencies that truly wanna buy omni-channel buys. So the focus is how do we use programmatic techno technologies to tap media owners inventory and go beyond just where we're selling today, which is to local advertisers direct, to out-of-home specialists direct, and now we start to open our inventory up to the same buyers that are buying online, mobile, and social can now layer in that same data and to make out-of-home buys exist today. Great, thanks Ian. And thanks Mark for both of you speaking from your own experiences about all of the opportunities that programmatic really aims to open up across the whole out-of-home ecosystem. Um, so, you know, jumping back to something Mark said at the beginning, I think oftentimes in conversations about programmatic, there can be a lot of confusion and often they can get over unnecessarily overcomplicated. Um, there's a lot of acronyms and terms that get thrown about, but actually the basics of programmatic technology aren't all that complicated. So in this next section, I'm going to just walk through the core technology components that enable programmatic transactions, regardless of whether you're talking about online display video or in our case out of home. Um, so in the most straightforward form, a programmatic ecosystem contains three core elements, a demand side platform or DSP that marketers use to plan purchase and manage their ad campaigns a supply side platform or SSP that media owners use to sell and manage their inventory. And then the connection point between these two platforms, a marketplace that is known as an exchange. Um, there may be other technology components or companies that get involved in a campaign um, such as data providers, uh, but really at the heart of every programmatic transaction, there are these three elements representing the demand side, the supply side, and then the connection point between the two. Um, so flipping to the next slide, um, starting on the marketer side of this ecosystem, um, a DSP is really just defined as a computer-based platform that automates media buying across multiple sources. As Mark referenced, um, providing that access to inventory across a huge variety of providers is really one of the core functions of a DSP, um, enabling buyers to plan against uh, inventory in one through one uh, centralized point. DSPs give buyers the ability to apply uh, data-driven targeting rules such as audience segments or weather triggers to inform their campaign. And the DSP is actually software that's used to, to set up those, those parameters within the planning of a campaign in order to surface what inventory matches those parameters that have been set. Um, DSP platforms all use real-time bidding to try and purchase the buyer's desired inventory according to those rules and budget set. Um, in the webinar on Thursday, they're actually going to be getting into the details of how that bidding works. So I definitely encourage you to tune in for that. Um, and then finally, DSPs are really just the, the tool that buyers use to manage their campaigns once they're actually live. So Oftentimes this is uh, through a direct login where they can hop on and keep an eye on the delivery, budget pacing and performance of their campaigns. So they get a much more real time view on, on how their campaigns are actually operating. So if we go to the next slide, um, on the flip side of the ecosystem, an SSP is again, a computer-based platform that automates media selling to multiple demand sources through one central point. Um, so an SSP is really just a software tool that media owners use to make their inventory available for purchase. Um, the SSP is where media owners can control exactly which screens they want to sell programmatically and at what price. Um, and also where they can set up creative and brand restrictions um, 
this is often a pretty big misconception that comes up with programmatic that uh, in order to participate, um, media owners have to give up some of that control, whether that's over their pricing or over certain creative or brand category restrictions that they have. And that is certainly not the case. So the SSP is where, as a media owner, you can go in and apply exactly those restrictions um, or parameters around the individual venue or screens um, that you want to choose to make available. And finally, um, you know, an SSP is where media owners can actually monitor any live campaigns that are running on the network, uh, report on delivery, and then finally, and most importantly, perhaps, um, actually get some reporting and insights into the revenue that's being generated for your network. As Ian mentioned, this can be a really, um, a really powerful tool for media owners to get insight into the level of demand in the marketplace for your specific inventory and start to use that to you know, adapt your pricing strategy in order to maximize the yield on your network. So then finally, um, at the connection point between a DSP and an SSP is the ad exchange. And an ad exchange is just a digital marketplace that enables that actual transaction between the advertiser and the publisher or media owner. So we'll go through a more detailed transaction flow in the next section, but Essentially, an ad exchange receives and then broadcasts inventory details from the supply side and then receives and broadcasts bids from the demand side. So it's basically getting the details of an impression or a spot and then asking buyers if they're interested in buying that impression or spot at what price. The ad exchange conducts an auction and then transmits the results and winning creative back to the supplier. Um, again, we're going to go through an actual example of that that helps make those steps a little more concrete um, in the next section. Within, um, sorry, before we get to that, actually, um, within an ad exchange, there are two basic uh, programmatic transaction types. The open exchange, which is also known as open auction, and then private marketplace deals, often called PMPs. Um, in the open exchange, media owners make inventory available for any buyer to bid on, hence the term open. Um, as Ian referenced before, this is a really great benefit for media owners because it doesn't require any um, additional sales work on the media owner's part to actually sell that inventory. Once it's set up on the exchange, it becomes discoverable for any buyer to include on a plan if it meets the buyer's parameters. In a private marketplace deal or a PMP, a media owner makes specific inventory available for one specific buyer. Um, the inventory and the pricing is negotiated directly ahead of time between the buyer and the media owner, and then the deal is set up to run automatically through the platform. PMPs can also be a really great fit for media owners um, because it allows them to have a bit more tighter control over what they're selling and to whom, um, and facilitates a more direct connection between the buy and the sell side. Um, again, Thursday's webinar is going to go into more details on the specifics of these two transaction types, you know, and some good use cases for both of them. So I really encourage you to join that to get into the heart of these transactions. Um, but for now, um, let's try to make this a little more concrete by walking through an actual example of a campaign flow and how it looks from the supply side, uh, the buyer parameters, and then what actually happens in the tech layer in the middle. We can go on to the next slides. Um, Ian, I'll let you start over here since it always starts with uh, out of home becoming available. Yeah, and this is, and that was well well laid out, Leslie. Um, this is often where most vendors want to race to and they say, okay, where's the money at? I put all my inventory on there, where's the money? Um, so again, definitely tune in on Thursday. Um, there'll be a lot of tips on the importance of PMPs and open exchanges, but so we've, let's fast forward. We're here. Um, all of the vendor inventory is on the platform. So how it works from the back end side of things is once a vendor, uh, is on the platform and it could be multiple vendors, what those vendors are doing, they're connected through all the supply side platforms and we're sending out impressions. So anytime we have an available impression, we're pushing to the exchange and the exchange could be, hey, I only work with one supply side platform, or it may be like Lamar where we work with four or five different supply side platforms. So the platform itself 
the digital out of home inventory is saying, hey, I have available impression right now at this moment. And the way most vendors do it is it's a few rotations ahead of the available slot. So if you have a slot model and slot C is available within milliseconds, and again, um, anyone that challenges that out of home isn't truly selling programmatic, we are sending available impressions within milliseconds before that rotation over to the exchange itself. And what that then does is it broadcasts out to the exchange and says, hey, are there any buys that exist right now that are available that fit this time of day, fit these parameters? And if we go to the next slide there, we're just gonna be moving uh, from supply to exchange. From this point, now we're seeing, hey, exchange, this is what I have available um, for this time frame. What do you have on your side of things? And keep in mind, we're not just pinging out one impression, one slot available, hitting one campaign. We're talking about millions of impressions that are going out every millisecond. And what we're doing is we're hoping that there's multiple campaigns that are sitting out there which often there are in our space that are bidding for that inventory that fit the parameters of that specific campaign, um, or more importantly, that specific impression at time. So I'm gonna let my friend Mark take over on what that looks like once I say, hey Mark, I got millions of impressions, what do you have on your end on the exchange side? Yeah, so if we could flick on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, as Ian said, he's, he's set everything up on his side from a supply side. He has selected the inventory that he wants to make available for purchase through, uh, through the exchange. And now it's up to me to set up my campaign within the demand side platform. So we've got four examples here. Um, these all could be the same buyer or they could all be different buyers, but, but essentially you've got various different campaigns being set up within the DSP. So here we've got time to, to wine and dine, we've got uh, an alcohol brand, a, a car brand, there's a health brand there, and then a coffee brand as well. Effectively, what you do uh, for each of those, and if we can skip on to the next slide, is set your audience and your targeting criteria, right? So for, for the alcohol brand here, we're looking at a national campaign. We obviously want to target adults who are illegal drinking age or above. But we want to be in five uh, within proximity of five miles to liquor liquor stores. So for a, the, the car brand, we're actually only looking at three markets here, um, and really we want to tap into auto intenders or those looking to buy a car. But we want to reach those people when they're in proximity to car dealerships. For the health um, client, we're looking at just a male 45 plus with a household income of over 50k a year, and then for the coffee brand. We want to target those within two miles of, of a Dunkin Donuts um, and also commuter hubs as well. So whether that's transit or whatever, key commuter hubs across the, the certain markets. So essentially what you do is select, as you would with any other out of home campaign, your audience and your targeting criteria. And then what happens is you only bid on the exchange when that criteria is met based on the available impressions that have been offered by the supply side platform. So again, Ian is selecting his inventory that is being made available, and I am only bidding on the impressions that are relevant to that specific client at that specific time. The reason that real-time bidding is in place is that even though there are these four different clients here, there's definitely gonna be some crossover in terms of the screens that they wish to buy and at the times they wish to buy across the market. So that's why it's important that we have this real-time bidding uh, platform in place to ensure that the highest bidder wins that particular impression that's made available through the exchange. And if we skip onto the next slide. So um, I can pass it over to you actually, Leslie, um, on this one. Sure, so um, as Mark mentioned, this is where um, the exchange or the auction really comes into play. So as you can see in this example, um, the impressions made available uh, did not meet the criteria for the health campaign. So they actually are not submitting a bid in this particular case. But, you know, for all of the other three, those impressions do have some value. But the value varies depending on and their objectives. So they've submitted bids at different levels. So in this case, you can see that the auto campaign would win the bid as the highest, um, highest bidder. So that's where um, the exchange would actually run the auction, select the auto campaign as the winning bid, 
and then send that price to the SSP so that the media owner knows at what price their inventory was sold and then send a win notification back to the DSP so that the buyer knows that they were successful in actually um, bidding on and, and purchasing that inventory. Um, so then if we go to the next slide, then following that auction, um, the ad creatives actually get sent through and the SSP would then pass the ad creative on to whatever ad servers uh, the media owners are using for the actual delivery and display of the ad. Um, so hopefully this helps uh, bring to life a little bit more the end-to-end -end process of inventory becoming available uh, with certain details about location and venue um, and then matching that with the criteria and value that different advertisers have put in place um, and that connection point and kind of the, the matchmaking between the buy and the sell side is really what the underlying programmatic technology and if I could add one thing to that, because the one thing that keeps you up at night as a vendor and on the, the supply side is, okay, how do we adjust the campaign? So to Mark's point, there was four advertisers and only two of the four had the ability to win and one didn't bid. It, it's imperative for everyone on the call to also understand that we're also making sure if it's, and you'll learn more on Thursday, but if it's a PMP, that there's a lot of back in people paying attention to, hey, this client's just not ever winning a bid in a campaign. And what we don't want is a bad experience to where they just say, well, I never want to bid, so I'm, I'm not going to buy out of home programmatic anymore. There's a lot of, uh, both on the vendor side and on the supply sides that are communicating with folks like Mark and other DSPs and digital agencies that are saying, hey, maybe if we tweak a certain aspect of this campaign or Maybe if we opened up a broader uh, DMA buy or, or opened up to a, a broader audience type. So I, I want everyone on the call to know, because that is something that keeps the supply and the vendors up at night. Like, hey, I don't want to lose any revenue that I can make a minor tweak that could allow revenue to flow through. So I thought that was important for everyone to kind of know as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So just in the interest of time, I'll run through this section pretty quickly, um, but most of what we've covered up to this point applies not only to programmatic for out of home, but actually to programmatic in any medium, whether that's online display, video, mobile, what have you. Um, and a lot of the conversations around programmatic tend to focus on how to make out of home more similar to online digital media. And we've had a lot of success by bringing new digital dollars into the space by making the out of home media more familiar to digital buyers and the way they typically transact. But we don't want to lose sight of the fact that out of home is not the same as online media and we shouldn't ever aim for it to be. We don't want to lose the value of this unique media that we have. So I think it's important to keep in mind that um, in the online world, audience is really the only criteria that comes into play with programmatic transactions. It's the, it's the core um, deciding criteria for where to purchase inventory programmatically. And audience is a huge part of what comes into play for programmatic out of home. But the heart of out of home has always been location and context. And that does not disappear when you're talking about programmatic transactions. So whether that is um, targeting by geo definitions or proximity to a set of POIs um, or tailoring your campaign based on the environment of the screen, the venue type, um, or other physical world conditions such as weather triggering, um, location and context still are critical factors in planning any programmatic out of home campaign. Um, so we flip to the next side. Um, again, just quickly touching on two big areas that always come up in any uh, any discussion about programmatic for out-of-home are these other two ways in which out-of-home is extremely unique from online media. The first being that obviously out-of-home is a one-to-many medium. In the online world, one ad play equals one impression, so it's a pretty straightforward transaction. In out-of-home, an ad placement can reach any number of people, so the way we've solved for this today is that auditing groups such as Geopath and others in the space actually provide media owners with detailed impression data. And then most programmatic platforms employ what's known as an impression multiplier, so that for any given ad play, the correct number of impressions as detailed by that audited data get assigned to that ad play. So that's how we've sort of bridged the gap between impression-based buying and a one-to-many media. 
And again, um, this is a misconception that comes up with programmatic that media owners will lose that control over exactly what gets shown on, um, on their inventory, and that is not the case. So um, all SSPs provide a creative approval workflow to ensure timely approval so that campaigns can launch quickly and seamlessly, but that media owners still maintain that rigorous control over any content that gets displayed. Um, and then finally, again, with out of home, there's just a huge variety of the sizes and formats out there. That's one of the things that makes our, our media so unique. Um, but that can be a challenge for buyers who have to navigate getting all the correct creative um, sizing and formats available. So typically today, this is handled in one of two ways. Either um, these can be produced pre-buy by just creating multiple different versions of the creative and uploading them in bulk and making them available ahead of time, or um, post-buy through what's called automated transcoding technology, where buyers can upload a limited number of different creative assets and then those automatically get transcoded and reformatted to display properly on all um, available uh, inventory. So again, really the purpose of all of this is to say that programmatic is not aiming to remove what makes out of home unique, but to just streamline transactions and bring new strategies into the space. So continuing to highlight the importance of location and context, the value of having a high impact mass reach media and then actually ensuring that buyers have a good experience and creatives can be displayed beautifully on the full variety of inventory out there are all really critical components to building a programmatic ecosystem that actually uh, fuels very healthy growth for out of home rather than detracting from what makes this so unique. All right, so I'll pass it over to Ian to hopefully wrap this up with a bang. Yeah, so we'll, we'll finish up here. Um, I, again, the why does programmatic matter for, matter for out of home? The demand is there. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, new players come into the space uh, on the demand side, um, on the digital agency side, and we're seeing the ability to capture revenues from outside of direct buys and outside of just out of home specialists. And, and I'll touch on that real fast. The out-of-home specialist, in my opinion, the job does not change. Um, a good friend of mine who actually is going to be presenting on Thursday, her and I discussed this um, the same way, is it's not moving budgets that they would have already obtained from the holding company or from the brand direct and just throwing it into programmatic because it's just so much easier. It's more about how do we convince the brands who are spending in the online, spending on the, the platform, um, and spending on the, the social media sites to shift their funds into the out of home space. And, and that subtle shift may be, hey, let's do a data deterministic buy and see how out of home plays a role into that consumer journey across other media types that we're already buying for this brand. And once they're able, as Mark was talking about, once they're able to see that data and that sales lift in real time, that's when the agencies and the out-of-home specialists specifically can start to say, hey, we told you the medium worked. Let's continue to spend on this data-driven buy, but also let me show you some key out-of-home inventory. Maybe it's a wallscape. Maybe it's actual large format digital that they own for the entire day or for five days a week. And start to begin to see shifts of funds that go away from, and as I mentioned before, $135 billion is the goal on how do we tap into that. And I believe it's imperative that our friends at the out of home specialist side also play an important role in these programmatic transactions because they do understand the space. Um, I'll give you a two second story. When we first started seven years ago, we would see three impression, three spot buys, and we would get 35 cents in Cincinnati. And we would be like, I don't understand why this is happening. And the reason why it was happening is the medium itself, as Leslie mentioned, it's not one-to-one. -one. It's one to targeted, and that audience plays a significant role. So our direct out-of-home specialist side of things, I think that they'll continue to thrive and continue to grow because now they have a tool to prove out the space and we'll continue to see not only programmatic out-of-homes funds continue to increase, but we'll also see our direct buys increase. And you know, Mark and I discuss this often is the ability to win over brands. We know the power of our medium. We know how powerful out of home is. 
and the ability just to play in that ecosystem that they're buying in today, that's our proving ground to shift those funds over. So we're excited about that. On the vendor side, briefly, don't look at programmatic as anything other than another way to buy, and it's another channel. We talk internally at Lamar, you have local sales, you have national sales, you have regional sales, now we have programmatic sales. It's the ability to prove out the medium, and there's many different buys and brands that have different buy types that some are determined based off of data, some are determined based off of location, Programmatic allows you as the vendor to play in that space. And lastly, I'll, I'll end with this, and we can jump to that quick next slide. The incremental spend that exists in our space are rapidly growing on the programmatic side of things, and it allows us to use platforms. And this may sound crazy, but I love the fact that there's over 180 vendors that sit in some of these supply side platforms that prove out and I, I implore all of you to try this, is when you wake up in the morning from the time you go to sleep, talk to me about the different screens that are, you're engaged with. And we all know that this is gonna be one, but you'll quickly realize that there's a large format digital that you drive by every day. There's a screen at my gym. There is a screen in my elevator. And now you will begin to understand the importance of programmatic out of home and why a brand would like and continue to spend money in this facet. And I think as an industry, we are at the infancy of what programmatic and the effects that it's gonna have on us today. So OAAA, thank you guys. Mark and Leslie continue to learn from you guys. So we're appreciative of everything that you guys do for the space itself. And Erica, I think we have like 41 seconds left for questions. Yeah, hi, Ian, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Ian, Leslie, and Mark. Terrific presentation. We really appreciate your insights today. Yeah, we don't have much time. We did get quite a number of questions, but let me ask uh, just a couple of them really fast. Um, with uh, the uh, cookie going away, what does that mean for programmatic buying in the future? Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, essentially, not a great deal. There are, there are other ways of targeting audiences in the programmatic space and, and mainly the cookie going away just means that people will be focusing more on devices, which is what we do in the out of home space anyway. So in terms of, you know, the data we're using, it's all based on mobile location data. It's, it's not anything to do with cookies. So actually as an out of home industry, little will change. I think most of the effects and change is going to be in the online space. And guys, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, but that was a very quick answer. Well, great. Thank you. You know, I know, Ian, you kind of already touched on this. Uh, actually, all of you did. But let me let me ask it one more time, just so we can we can end up with uh, punctuation on this point. An account executive out there wants to know, when will my job be replaced by programmatic? I, I'll take this one because we have 1200 that ask me when the robots are coming. Um, it's it's very simple. We're automating the process in the way that you are able to truly show who you are. And if you got into out-of-home sales to fill out a spreadsheet and just to transact, then you may be in the wrong space now. I think now, especially of our medium, it allows you to go to folks like Mark and your local clients and say, here's the power of out-of-home. Let me show you how we can dynamically change content based off of your different audience types. Let me show you why this part of town is important in Baton Rouge on a Saturday morning as people are headed to go tailgate. So I would argue that your job is gonna become amplified and you're gonna be more excited about coming to work every day as opposed to pushing paper and pushing spreadsheets. This is gonna elevate you as a salesperson. And I personally am is beyond excited that what this opportunity allows them to be. Great, thank you. Thank you all, uh, thank you panelists and thank you listeners for joining us today. A recording of the webinar will be available later this afternoon from the OAAA website. And please do be sure to join us this Thursday for the second part of this programmatic series when we will discuss programmatic transactions. So everybody have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye now.